Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today we are joined back by our friend, Mr. Dan Garza for Peisty Collecting Part 2. Dan, welcome back. Part 2. <laughs> Part 2. Thank you. Good to have you here, man. Yes, yes. So um, excited to have you back. I kind of knew it was going to happen because you and I can talk for a long time and there's yeah. There's a lot of info. This is super detailed. Um, I think you did a great job on part one. Real quick, Dan, let me let me do something real quick. I want to give uh, we have a Patreon shout out. Uh, my friend Vincent Ward, who's been on the podcast a handful of times and just did the Zildjian collecting episode, joined up on Patreon um, at the upper tier. So thank you to my friend Vincent Ward. I think people know from that episode we are old friends and um, and it's really cool. So. Vincent runs Vitalizer Drums, and that's kind of what he's going to promote at the end of the episode with the little card. He redoes Speed King pedals and collects and sells and all kinds of cool stuff. So thank you to Vincent, Vitalizer Drums, um, for supporting the podcast. But now, Dan, let's hop in here. I know you have a couple things you want to touch on first Yeah. F- about the first one, and then we'll move forward with yeah. uh, part part two. Yeah, so of course I watched the first episode a bunch of times too. So a couple of quick notes. Um, I was talking about um, Kleinen Zeigen, which uh, translates to marketplace. So that's eBay marketplace. And I know you're going to put a whole whole load of links in the in the first episode, so that'll be in there. Um, also, with the Facebook pages, I really strongly recommend anybody who's interested and and. Even if you're just looking for a symbol, if you want to post a link in one of the um, uh, uh, Facebook groups, you know, probably the biggest one would be the uh, Pisces Symbols New and Vintage. That's one of the biggest ones. And there's a couple uh, more specific groups like the uh, Sun Creation Formula 602. Um, there's a 2002 group. Uh, there's one for Stambul's 404s, 505s. Um, but um, yeah, I, I, I strongly recommend, even if it's just a question, like, hey, what should I get? Or what is, you know, what sounds good? Um, yep. And again, I, you're going to have all those links. So you can just you can just click on one of those links and just, you know, and it's moderated. I moderate a couple of them, but my couple of people I know moderate the rest of them. So they're very well run. Um, cool. Next thing is, um, in the beginning, we're talking about uh, production and cast versus sheet bronze. Well, the one thing that occurred to me is that there really is a truly cast symbol, and those are UFIPS, because UFIPS uses a rotocasting process, which they literally pour the molten bronze into a spinning mold in the, in, in the center of the mold, and it's in the shape of a symbol with the bell and the bow, the curve, everything already pre-shaped. So they don't have mm. to roll the bronze at all. It's basically... It's basically what would be called low pressure cast because there's a, a, a small amount of pressure, which is good for casting because it makes it more dense and stronger. Anyways. Cool. Yeah. Um, the other thing, because we're kind of wrapped at the 602 section, I wanted to touch really briefly in that. Um, I know probably a lot of people are like, oh, well, you know, who, who plays 602s? There was a period in the late 60s where there was a lot of drummers that you didn't even wouldn't even know or even consider. One of them obviously was Ringo. You know, he had that 602 medium ride in, in the get back sessions and he had a pair of sound edge hi-hats. Yeah. Um, the other ones, obviously, Charlie Watts was a 602 player. Uh, Phil Collins, through basically his whole career with um, Genesis up to Duke, he was playing 602s and, and some sound creations. Uh, Bonham played 602s very early on live. We don't know if we recorded. That's something I know you cover with George. Uh, another big 602 player was Keith Moon. And he played him, I believe, he played him at Woodstock, watching the Woodstock film. Those are, I could see, those are 602s. And he may have used them on Who's Next. I'm not 100% sure. Uh, Clive Bunker, the original drummer for Jethro Tull, you know, Aqualung. Yeah. Those are 602s. Wow. He was a 602. Some heavy big, hitters. Yeah. Well, I mean, that was 1970. 71, yeah. there were no 2002. The big one, yeah. though, that people are totally unaware of is Doug Clifford from C- Creedence Clearwater Revival. And all of those big hits are all 602s. And John DeChristopher mm. interviewed him and actually asked him, because I thought he was playing giant beats, but he wasn't. He was playing all 602s. Uh, Bill wow. Bruford, during his time with the S, was playing 602s. Michael Shreve in Santana, 
He played Zildjian's at Woodstock, but in 1970, I've got a video where you could see him, and he was also in Pisces' book. He was a, a bona fide endorser. Mick Fleetwood from Fleetwood Mac, uh, Ainsley Dunbar, who ended up in Journey before that. He was with Frank Zappa. He was playing 602s. Uh, Bobby Elliott, Elliott and Hollies. Uh, Dave Maddox uh, was in Fairport Convention in the 70s. Uh, Simon Kirk, before he was in Bad Company, was he, in, he was in Free. He was playing 602s. And then the big one, which is really shocking, is John Densmore of The Doors played 602s. Now, wow. I know for a large portion of his career played Zildjian's, but my understanding, and I need verification, is that he played 602s on L.A. Woman. And I have a picture of him from about 68, where he's you could see he's playing a full set of 602s. So it could be that he rotated back and forth depending on what was available. You know, he may have some gear at home or what what he toured with, but he definitely was a 602 player off and on. There's a Smother Brothers video I saw recently where you could clearly see he's playing 602s. Okay. Cool. Um, the other thing that I was just going to touch on very briefly, because I know this is supposed to be about collecting symbols, is um, that I mentioned to you earlier, but I didn't mention on on uh, this podcast was that I actually was an audio engineer for 10 years. I actually had my own studio and I recorded a lot of drummers in those 10 years. I learned a lot about audio and, and, and how drums are recorded, how drums sound, um, you know, in the control room and how much the microphone, the mic pre, any kind of outboard gear and analog tape. Cause we use analog tape back then. This is 92 to 2003. Um, how much it changed the sound of drums for the better. But what I was going to say is that a lot of drummers are like, oh, you know, I like my favorite drummer plays these cymbals. I want, I want to get the same model. And what you're going to yeah. find out is when you take them home, they're not going to sound like the recording. You know, it, it, the recording process it can't replicate what you hear live, regardless of whether it's analog or digital. You know, it, it, it just, it's, it's, it can't. Um, the other thing, too, is I found out very early on when I started playing the drums was that my drum set sounded very different when I stood in front of it than from when I was behind it. And the one thing I try to suggest to people is that if you are lucky enough to audition a cymbal, if you if you go see a buyer in person, have them hit the cymbal and walk out of the room and listen down the hall or at a distance, because that's going to yeah. give you a better idea of like the frequency balance, you know, the kind of the wash or the crash. You know, even with the right symbol too, it gives you a much better idea. When you're up really close to the to the symbol, you're kind of overwhelmed, and your hearing is different too. The way that your ears work at a higher sound pressure level than when they do at a lower sound pressure level. It's called the Fletcher Munson curve. Anyways, I think that's about it for for the for the little uh, minutia. Yeah, that's all good. And then I think if we're if we're moving forward, just to retouch on everyone. I mean, if if you you probably. If you're watching this, you probably watched part one, but in that one, we covered a lot of symbol lines. We covered serial numbers. We covered the factories, which all relates to collectability and where they came from. And just yeah. that's some good background. Dan also has two full history episodes that he's done, which you can find in the description or just look it up on YouTube or wherever the my website. Um, but I believe now we're going to hear a little bit. We will get back to the 602. I believe we left off on the dark ride, correct? Yeah. The 602 dark ride. But you wanted to touch a little bit about um, U.S. distributors first, correct? Yeah, because it's so much the, the next three, which is the dark ride, the giant beat, and the 2002, the, the big ones, what everybody's been waiting for. There's a large portion of, of, of the story about them that's completely dictated by the distributor. So... Quick, as quickly as I can, the first U.S. distributor that we know of is a company called Dynastar in upstate, in Syracuse, New York. And they were importing 602s from right about 62 to early 65, basically right before Ludwig took over. Now, what is really cool about these is, like I said in the last episode, Peisty used to make a custom stamp for usually distributors or drum companies. And they did that with Dynastar. It was called the Dynastar 602. Um, I would really like to, to buy one of these or find one of these. There was one on Reverb about two years ago, and I I should have just bought it on the spot, and I didn't. Um, yeah. I've only seen one. That's the only one that I've ever seen. Um, and they were only sold that way in the U.S. They also sold 
a couple of the lower lines. They did sell Stambouls and Dixies, but I don't think they changed the stamp, and that's not really relevant. That's it's not something people were probably going to be looking to collect. The next one is the big one, and that's Ludwig. And I know I kind of already went through it quite a bit, but the one thing I did miss was that Ludwig actually started to sell and import Peisty Gongs first in 1953, before they actually sold any of their symbols. And again, this original deal was set up by McHale, not by Robert and Tumas. This is when McHale, you know, uh, before there's the Swiss factory, when you had the old world, old world Peisty, there is also, I don't have any proof, but I've seen more than once a reference in articles that there was some sort of relationship or contact between McHale and and a, a, a Bill Junior or Bill Senior Ludwig before World War II. But I I've scoured Ludwig catalogs and I can't find any proof that they sold any Pisces gongs or any Pisces symbols. But there supposedly there was contact. The one thing I do know in a Robert Pisces interview is he stated that. The Ludwig family sent them care packages right after World War II. We're talking like 46, 47, because there was that two year period, really a three year period, where there were refugees because they fled Krakow, Poland, and I think January 45, and they fled into northern Germany. And they weren't able to start up again until 47. So you had 45, 46, and probably part of 47. So you had a good two and a half year span where they weren't. You know, they were basically, yeah. you know, you know how it is with refugees. Um, sure. So so the Ludwig family sent them care packages directly. Um, I don't know if that was food or clothing or what it was, but that means that they knew who the Peisty family was, which means they had to have some sort of relationship before World War II. Even yeah. if it was just Mikhail sent Bill Sr. samples, you know. Anyways. Yeah. The big one, and this is, this is the deal that Mikhail set up, was, and I think I went over this in, in the old podcast, was they set up uh, where Ludwig was going to s- distribute Stambouls with their name on it, the three star. And that deal was made in 56. And Peisty made a lot of money off of that. I mean, it was it was huge for them. Um, quickly going through this, because I know we've already been through all of this. Um, 602s and about 65. Um, the whole thing with 602s happened because Ivor Arbiter of of uh, London, who owns a huge music store in London, he's the one who who uh, uh, pushed Bill Jr. to start importing and selling 602s. Um, so Bill made a trip with uh, Bob Yeager, who is the owner of the Pro Drum Shop in Hollywood, who was his technical consultant in 64, and it took a trip to the factory, to Switzerland. And that was the setup the uh, distributorship, and they actually went through the line. Uh, Pierre Favre uh, had just started. He had started with Pisces in 64, and I have pictures, which I'll show, of them getting together and testing symbols, and you see Pierre, like, showing Bob, you know, going through 602s. What became of this was that, and this is in Bill Ludwig's book, that Bill and, and Bob Yeager had decided that the symbols were too thick for the American market, and I guess it's a way... Bill Jr. put it. So they asked Pisces to go through all the weights and and basically reduce them. So basically, you know, a medium is more like a thin crash. A thin crash is closer yeah. to like a thin, like a paper thin, on and on and on and on. Um, I believe they did the same thing also with the three stars. And then during that period of time, that's also when they switched to the standard. You know, so when they premiered 602s on the lower catalog, that's also when they started to to uh, sell the standard, which is still a Stambul. They just basically changed the stamp. Sure. Um, yeah. or, or emboss is kind of the way we can explain, like a metal stamp. This week's episode is brought to you by Round Sound Symbols. Are you a drummer looking for the perfect symbol to complete your sound? Look no further than Round Sound Symbols. Founded and operated by passionate drummers just like you, they're obsessed with symbols and dedicated to bringing you the best selection available. Round Sound stocks everything from the boutique makers to the big cymbal houses, with a focus on the art of hand-hammered cymbal making. They proudly carry new cymbals from Istanbul Mehmet, Peisty, Bosphorus, Cymbal Craftsman and Royal Cymbals, Murat Duril, Byrne, Mangiello, Sabian, Duril, PGB Artisan, Timothy Roberts, Cymbal and Gong, Leon Cymbals, Koei Day, Dream, T Cymbals, and Masterwork. Round Sound thinks it's extremely important to hear the cymbals you are purchasing. 
So you can listen, compare, and decide which symbol is best for you at roundsoundsymbols.com with unique sound files for every symbol on their website. They feature internet matched pricing, no sales tax on orders shipped outside of California, and free shipping in the continental US. And you can trade in your old symbols for store credit. Listeners of the Drum History Podcast will receive 10% off your entire order of new in stock symbols at roundsoundsymbols.com. Some exclusions apply. Simply use the code DHP10 at checkout to receive your discount. That's promo code DHP10 to save 10% off at roundsoundsymbols.com. Thanks to Round Sound Symbols for sponsoring this episode. So the one thing sort of reminds me I forgot to mention uh, last week was, Bart, when you asked me about um, serial numbers, you're like, well, how do I tell a 72 serial number from, a, from an 82 serial number? And I'm like, oh, well, the 82 has Pisces in the model name stamped above the serial number, which is true. But it totally escaped me that by spring or summer of 81, Pisces went to the car- colored labels on the symbols and they removed the metal stamp or emboss, the logo stamp that all symbols had at that point, right? Mm. Um, yeah. Usually a lot of people refer to it as an emboss, so they don't mix it up with an ink stamp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which so, I understand. That did get not confusing, but I when with the Zildjian one, it was like... Our, the term stamp, I think of like a ink yeah. stamp, but emboss makes sense yeah. with it's embossed. Yeah. yeah, and that's the other thing with 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 German. Well, we'll get to that. But the, the German two thousand twos is it says made in Germany on them in uh, on the stamp, right? And then yeah. and then uh, I'll, I'll get to it with the two thousand twos. So sure. To finish up with Ludwig, um, what happened was, and this was. There's two episodes of Pisces history, not to get too out, far off track, but um, there's two episodes that have has given Pisces reputation for half a century, which is Pisces crack more. Pisces crack more than Zildjian. The two things that I always see is Pisces are sheep on symbols and they crack more than Zildjians. Those are the two things that I see constantly from drummers online. And I've heard for decades. Yeah. So... There's two instances. The second instance I'll get to a little later, but the first instance that started this was because Ludwig had gone through all of Pisces lines and asked them to thin out all their weights to make them thinner. We're talking 65, a year after the British invasion. And and there's actually a whole chapter on the wiki about Ludwig where I go into in-depth explaining it. But basically what it boils down to is we have thousands and thousands of young drummers in 65, 66, 67 who are just starting to play the drums they get a new Ludwig drum set and they get a set of you know standards or 602s and they break them because they don't have good technique they're hard hitters they don't know how to hit a hit a cymbal properly yeah. the cymbals are mount, mounted properly and um there was this huge history, his, issue where Ludwig was taking back all of these cymbals that are cracking and replacing them and Long story short, there's a there's a Robert Pisty interview that that Mr. Fritz conducted, and Robert Pisty addresses it. It's on the wiki, and basically it kind of comes into a he said she said scenario where Bill Ludwig in his book says that he had taken all these symbols back, and then Pisty refused to reimburse him, and then Robert Pisty says, "No, we did reimburse him. That's not true." Yada yada yada. I don't know how long this went on for, but it must have gone on for at least a f- several years because. What I do know from the from the Robert, actually from both the book and the Robert Pisty interview, was that Ludwig dumped Pisty big time, and they had a running contract right for production for X amount of symbols per month, and Ludwig just stopped ordering. You know, they basically they they yeah. ghost they ghosted Pisty. Yeah, they, they kicked him to the curb. I don't know how they else to burnt. say. It. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I yeah. think this happened in 1972. Robert Pisces talks about how they went through a really difficult time. It doesn't say what year, but they went through a really difficult time where they actually had to had to pick up it's in it's in the older podcast where they actually had to do yeah. other work yeah, yeah. to make symbols just to pay the employees. I remember that, yeah. So I think this is in 72 because the 73 Ludwig catalog, which still shows the full lineup, but remember the catalogs are assembled the year before. So this catalog would have been put together in 72. Now Ludwig kind of does like odd year catalogs. They have a 73 and have a 75 catalog, but I don't think there's a 74 catalog. The 75 catalog, everything's gone except for standards, a very small selection. And then now they're carrying Zildjian's again. 
Um, and those standards, I'm sure, were just leftovers, you know, because yeah. they had they had, they probably thou- had a ton of them. Oh, thousands yeah. of them. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that the cutoff happened sometime in late '72. Also, the fact that there's very few B8 standards or stenopals. And I, I was saying in the last episode, I have a standard uh, that's made for B8, um, but no serial because the Swiss factory didn't put serial numbers on those symbols. Uh, you're inconsistent. So it's B8, so it's got to be at least 71, if not 72. But that was basically yep. it. Um, the next era we run into is Roger CBS. And it's interesting because I know your last episode was was yeah. I talk about Rogers with Anthony. Yep. Yeah. So this is this is the CBS era of Rogers. Um, what I, I didn't know until recently was that um, Rogers didn't start distributing uh, Pisces until 1974. So you probably had a two year span in the U.S. where you had zero Pisces. Now, if we back up just a little bit to Ludwig, Ludwig never sold 2002s. And that's another indicator that they probably stopped sometime in 72. They never had 2002s in the catalog. As far as I know, they never sold 2002s. They did sell giant beats, uh, but they didn't start till 69, from what I could tell, from advertising. And they initially didn't sell the 24, which kind of makes sense because 21st giant beats in the U.S. were really rare. Hmm. They're, they're rare everywhere, but especially in the U.S. Um, sure. And they did sell... Basically, the full line, including gongs, the Seven Sound set, the Morello set. Um, but yeah, there, there was this big hole uh, during that period of time. Now, when Rogers did start to sell uh, Pisces, they only sold 2002s. They didn't sell anything else in 74. And they only sold basically, you know, I think they sold 14 and 15 inch hi hats, 16, 18, 20, and 22. That's it. Medium, wow. crash, ride. 20, and no 24. Um, in 78, when the Sun Creation line came out, they added Sun Creations, and then they also added 404s. They didn't sell 505s, but they did sell 404s. And that ties in with the very beginning of the last step, the last episode when I was telling you about my dude neighbors. When those two guys got 404s <laughs> in 78, those were Rogers distributed 404s, and they probably got some of the first ones that were sold in the U.S. Wow. So let me ask you while we're on the Rogers thing. So is there because because as we said, it would say Ludwig Standard or something like that. When you get a 2002 distributed by Rogers, was it marked Rogers on it clearly, or was it just 2002? Yeah, it just had so that. The, co- collectability wise, you wouldn't know if it's Rogers or One Way Herb just bought at a store on its own, it would just be correct. The, 2002. the okay. one thing that you can be sure of though, is that I'm 99.99999% positive that they did not sell German 2002s in the U S and you can, okay. and then you could just tell by the rarity. Um, I mean, there are a few here and there. Um, once in a great well, you see one on reverb. Um, but I, I'm almost positive that they were, um, they were imported, you know, either a drummer, went to Europe and bought them, was like a touring yep. drummer, you know, or maybe... Picked one up. Yeah, yeah or, or maybe they came in through Canada. You know, it, there, I've seen some odd stuff, you know, for sale in the U.S., and it's like, you know, I remember, I think one of them I talked to, a guy said, where'd you get this? It's like, oh, I bought it from this guy from Canada, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. So, sure. Okay. So, with, so with Rogers, um, very, very limited, but at least they, they were selling a lot of 2002s. Um the, the sound creations, not so much. Four fours, four fours. All they offered were four inch high hats, sixteen, eighteen, twenty. That's it. They only had four sizes. Very, very mm-hmm. limited. Um, no six o twos, but you could special order them. But it's a hundred day wait. <laughs> wow. Yeah, a long time. Jeez. Um, never imported anything else. No Stambouls, no five o fives, no Dixies, no nothing. Um, I think. I'd have to find the article, but in, in 81, well, in 81, Pisces opened up the Brea Distribution Center in Brea, California. And you say, well, where's Brea, California? Brea, California is like five or 10 miles north of Disneyland. So it's basically just north of Orange County in, in LA County. Uh, and it's okay. about, if I didn't, I didn't tell people the first episode, I live in Los Angeles. So uh, Brea is probably about, well, without traffic, it's about 25 minutes from me. With traffic, it's probably closer to an hour. 
Um, yeah, yeah. And yeah. I've been, I've been there before, way, way, way back in the '90s. I went there once, uh, but that's not. It's not a place. It's not normally a walk-in place. No, it's like a place of business. I'm yeah. Sure. <laughs> Just, well, it's a distribution yeah. center. It's a warehouse. That's where. Yeah, yeah. All yeah. the symbols in the U.S. and I think in North America, so U.S., Canada, and Mexico all come through there. Um, wow. At any rate, cool. I think what happened is is Heisty realized that. Uh, Obviously, the, the demand in the U.S. was high enough that they could justify opening up the expense of opening up a distribution center. And I can tell you, again, going back to that story when I was a kid, I lived in Massachusetts for three years. I moved back out here in the summer of 82 with my buddy. And, uh, you know, I was in a band with when I was in Massachusetts. This is the guy that we used to go to U World Series. He used to drive the U World Series. He was a guitar player. So we moved back out here, you know, dude, we're going to be rock stars. Totally. Mm-hmm. We're yeah. gonna we're gonna cruise the strip, cruise all the clubs, and the first thing we did was we hit Guitar Center, the old Guitar Center on Sunset. Which if you're old, if guys are old enough, they know what I'm talking about. That's the old location. And summer of '82, I walk into Guitar Center. I didn't know that the brand distribution distribution center existed, but what I did know is I walked in there and it was like Valhalla. I mean, I can hear angels singing in the background. It's like, <laughs> oh. Yeah, and I walk, in, walk into the drum department, and it's like you can't imagine the amount of equipment they had, the amount of stock. I mean, not just cymbals, but drums. But they had this yeah, enormous yeah. Pisces display. They had a percussion set, which if people don't know, I'll show a picture of. Um, they had obviously 2002s. They had 602s. I had never seen 602s before. I'm like, no way. And they were all colored labels. Now, I knew about oh, the colored cool. labels because I'd bought two of them in 80 or 81 and 82 in Massachusetts from Big JD. But, mm-hmm. you know, there's sound creations. I'd never seen sound creations before. There's there's 505s. There's 404s. It's like, wow. You know, everything. So, yeah. Um, it was it was a really great time. And it was perfect timing because the summer, 81 and 82, was the beginning of the Sunset Strip and the hair metal scene. And if you guys don't know what that is, that is all of these Hollywood rock bands that came out of that scene. And we're talking, and I saw all these bands and clubs. We're talking Motley Crue, Rat, Quiet Riot. Uh, I mean, I could go on and on and on. And I saw all of yeah. them when they're still in clubs, you know? I saw Motley Crue sure. at Magic Mountain, which is an amusement park. <laughs> God, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Wow. And Nikki Six was like his boots on fire. Match. There's like a bunch of kids and their <laughs> moms awesome. and Nikki's like lighting his boots on fire. I'm like, nice. <laughs> yeah. They so, just needed the gig, I'm sure, at that point. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So cool. That, yeah. that's, your, that's your distributors. It's important because that gives you an idea of what symbols were available when in the U.S. And you see it was really slim pickings, especially early on. Um, and that helps me transition into the 602 Dark Ride. The first thing about the 602 Dark Ride is... That's Freddie's brainchild, Freddie Studer. That's all Freddie. And can you say who Freddie Studer is one more time, just for this part two? Just sure. To- Freddie Studer was their sound de- their head of their sound development. He worked side by side, hand in hand, with Robert Peisty on developing cymbals. He started in 1970 in cymbal testing. He he replaced Pierre Fabre. Pierre Pierre was the head uh, cymbal tester and sound developer from '64 to '70. So I think a lot of the, the 602 sound, the 7 sound set, and even the Joe Morello symbols, I think, up here, I think had a lot to do with, well, obviously along with Robert. Sure. But 7071 is when Freddie comes in, and Freddie is, he, he calls it electric jazz, but I think we Americans know it better as jazz fusion. And mm-hmm. that's what he was into big time. And um, there is, I think I said in the first episode, I interviewed Freddie last year before he passed away. And it was an interview I did with them um, on the, on the wiki. You know, it was, it was an email correspondence over two months, but yeah, you know, and Freddie was incredibly gracious. He was very patient, very kind, just, you know, I wish I could have met him in person, you know? Yes. But he unfortunately passed away right after your in August. Yeah. Correspondence. Of, of 2022. Yeah. Um, I asked him specifically about the dark ride and, and sound creation symbols. And I just want to read a little quote from the interview. And it says, I told Robert since the first half of the 70s that Pisces needs a darker sound, which will hopefully turn on jazz drummers. So far, many, many jazz drummers were not attracted to Pisces because the sound was too bright and too clean for them. 
To be honest, I came up with the idea that for the 22, it's dark right because I wanted to have a symbol like that for myself. I bought many different records for Robert and the two of us were spending nights with, with good beer and good wine, listening to many jazz players and their cymbal sounds, Tony Williams, Steve Gadd, Al Foster, Elvin Jones. This helped Robert understand what sound I was looking for. Mm. So he was really cool. the, the, the impetus behind developing this. Now, Jack D. Jeanette was one of their main, or the, I, the other thing I asked Freddie about, he was one of the, the, the other uh, factor where they would give Jack samples. So they basically would have, you know, somebody, you know, it, it was, it was Freddie, you know, Freddie's like, you know, I, Jack's cool. He's a great drummer. He'd be the perfect test subject for, for, for beta tester. He'd be a beta tester. Yeah. So he the was, drum, also, he, who would know better than the drummer who's actually out there playing yeah. the, in the American market, you know, and that yeah. style of music. So yeah. basically the dark ride, was I would say again, this is just my educated guess like 50% Freddy, 25% Rob, Robert, 25% Jack, you know. But it, it's you know, talking to him about the Dark Ride and Sound Creation series, you could see that was that was his thing. He mm, really, sure. really, really, you know. So, so the Dark Ride was a 602 symbol, it was only 22 inches. Um, I think the weight was was close to a 22 inch 602 heavy. I think it was they're very similar. They are between. I I'd have to look it up. It's on the wiki. It's either it's either between a medium ride and a heavy, or leaning towards a heavy in weight. Um, same alloy, same bell. Um, it's basically the hammering and the lathing that's different, and it's very different. As mm. people know, it, it see it's very heavy. Um, yeah. In Europe, because 602s were sold everywhere, that was the 602 Dark Ride. In the U.S., what Rogers did was they actually listed the Dark Ride as a 2002, <laughs> wow. even though even it's though it was a B20 symbol. So I have a picture. Club. Of, yeah, yeah. I think a catalog listed from '77, and you'll see how it says it's Dark Ride among the 2002s. Mm. Um, so with the European. Uh, dark rides, there was no difference. You know, this is the black label era, so they had, they had what was called the outline stamp, right? The standard 602 outline stamp. In the U.S., because they weren't sold as 602s, and actually you were asking me about if Pisces ever made a custom stamp for Rogers. I guess they actually did. Not with the Rogers stand, but with the dark ride, what they did is they left off Formula 602 off the emboss or metal stamp. And they actually used the archaic 602 stamp, which is the E over trade stamp. Mm -hmm. So when you see these early dark rides, 75, 76, 77, you'll see that old archaic stamp. Um, once you get to the sound creations, obviously, then you get a, you get a whole new stamp. But my understanding, and there's probably, there's a lot of dark ride experts on the Facebook forums that probably know more about this i think when they transitioned to sound creations initially in 78 it was the same symbol there are changes along the way 75 76 77 those three years under rogers you can see changes in the hammering hmm. um interesting and when you get to 78 i think maybe they kind of had settled down on and, and settled more for a standard and you'll see that carried to the sound creation line to 84 where i think the hammering is pretty consistent for those six years I'm starting to get into some creations now. Well, where where are we in the level of collectability nowadays oh. with these <laughs> these 602 dark rides? Are these like the oh, Holy yeah. Grail or yeah. pretty much, yeah. Yeah. I mean a, a good yeah. one, one that still has the ink, if it, if it's a Rogers, you know, well well, I mean it's any 602 dark ride is gonna be a Rogers distributed dark ride. Well, that's not true because if you get it from Europe, it won't be. But but that time period, yeah. if you get a US one or whatever would be distributed yeah, by Rogers. if it's got yeah. if it's got ink if it's all it's ink and it's clean i mean you could probably get easily a thousand bucks for it wow you know? so i mean it's you're getting into like k zildjian territory with those so sure cool. but it's it's a unique symbol i mean it's you you have to like that sound it's not for everybody you know mm. you, you know if i could afford it i i would probably own one you know yeah yeah, but jazz rides, I think, in general, fall into that category of like, 
they're really rare but like you might not like it yeah. like i'm i find some rides i'm like wow i don't like that that's too yeah. dry or that wouldn't work for yeah. my like general kind of drumming but yeah. like you know but whatever I'll, I'll, it's cool I'll, I'll, I'll tell you right now uh that symbol is 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 by modern standards way too heavy i mean i see where trends go where where guys are really using like crashes or even thin crashes for rides now you know and this yeah. symbol was much heavier than that you know it was i mean yeah. it was basically a medium it was a medium ride or even a heavyweight symbol so you know, it has a strong okay. bell and has a really strong ping. It's dark, but it's not, you know, a, a comparable 22 to key Zildjian would be much, much lighter, much lighter. Gotcha. You know, definitely. All right. Definitely. Big but difference. collectible. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I guess we can now kind of take one step back and go to Giant Beats. Sure. The famous Giant Beats. Yeah. So, you know, Giant Beats are kind of an enigma in that, you know, uh, they only produced, I mean, uh, initially one pair of hi hats, and you had three sizes, 18, 20, 24. And I asked Freddie in an interview, why don't you guys make a 16 or 22 giant beat? And he said that when him and Robert were working, well, Robert, I guess, originally developed it, but he said that I guess they continued development because he was at Pisces when the black labels came out. So, real quick, the white labels, which isn't really white. It's more kind of like a, a I don't know, like an off-white tan uh, color uh, at nine o'clock. It says Giant Beat. And those are what are called the white labels. And those run from 67 to 72. And those don't have serials that I know of because they, they change to the black labels right when they're starting to apply serial numbers. So my guess is that the... Um, White label giant beats never had a serial. So identifying giant beats, the majority of obviously the ink is gone. Um, the easiest way to identify them is by the stamp, the emboss. And yep. the white labels have what kind of looks like a 602 stamp. It's the same format, but the Piesty is below the star and crescent moon and rays. And that format is actually very similar to the Ludwig standard stamp format. Um, I don't know why they chose that format. Um, I mean, it's, 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 it's cool, but they yeah, changed it, it when you, when they went to the black label. And what's really strange is with the black label starting in, in 72, um, they changed the embosser stamp and they went to the E over trade stamp. So that's the old archaic E over trade. Uh, it doesn't say obviously formula 602. You have the Star and Crescent Moon, the Rays, the Robert Peisty signature, and then Made in Switzerland. So they just basically picked up the old 602 stamp and put it on black labels. What doesn't make sense is why would they use basically a newer or a redesigned stamp on the white labels and then change it and go to an older stamp for the black labels? But that's kind of... Yeah, yeah. Peisty kind of moves in weird and mysterious ways sometimes, some of the stuff they do. Hmm. Well, it seems like like no one thinks if you're working there that maybe people won't care or notice when of course guys like you and the Pisces, yeah. you know, symbol fans notice, but yeah, you're right. It is mysterious, but could have just been something totally random. I, I mean, I think they made the change because there was a mar a substantial change in the symbol itself. I don't, again, I, you know, forgive me for not doing enough research, but I think the weights may have been slightly different between the white labels and black labels. Uh, I think they sound a little different. Um, you listen like Led Zeppelin three; those are white labels. But you listen to Led Zeppelin four; I think those are probably black labels. Um, gotcha. And and physical graffiti. Um, or no, I'm sorry. Houses of the Holy. Houses of the Holy are black labels. The thing about Giant Beats is weird is that I was looking at the catalog the other night for this episode. I was trying to do a little more research. They were priced lower. The 2002s during that same period of time, they were 17 percent cheaper, according to my calculator. I'm trying to think of an equivalent today. I, I think basically these were kind of like almost fashionable. It's like you know, it was for a particular style of music. Um, not to say that they were cheaply made, but I think that they, they were kind of a, a, a kind of an oddball series. 
compared to the, the 2000. giant beats are. Yeah, compared to the 2002s. Yeah. I mean, they were kind of a, really a stepping stone to the 2002. Um, sure. And they weren't really made that long. They're made from 67 to 74. So you're talking seven years. And Ludwig didn't start selling them until 69 in the US. So there's just, there's not a lot of them. And there's not a lot in Europe either. You know, what's interesting is that. Um, I believe, and I think we'd get into this a little later with with um, European and and, uh, and and Japanese distributors. Pearl so giant beats in Japan, and I actually have some pictures of some Japanese giant beats. And the one thing that's interesting cool. is that the giant beat hi hats. The Japanese giant beat hi hats have a T and a B to denote top and bottom, and I've never seen that before. But I've seen a couple pairs of Japanese giant beats that have that. So for whatever reason, they did that for the Japanese market. Maybe Pearl asked them to do that. To not be, I mean, because normally you would just tell by one's heavier, on the heavier one goes on the bottom, or it would say top or bottom or yeah, something. Yeah, I but mean, that's... sure. I mean, when even pre-serials, they had the red at three o'clock, they had the red ink, they would tell you either the weight, if it was like a, yeah. a, a thin, thin crash or a medium or a medium ride, or it would say top high hat, bottom high hat. So you'd know, yeah. you know, which orientation. Yeah, yeah. To put yeah. them in. As far as collecting goes, I know they're really popular. I mean, pe- people love to collect them. Um, the one big problem with them is is I don't know what they. I, I don't know if they use a colored black or they do something to change the color to make it more brown. I've never been able to figure out what it is. But the, the drawback is, is if you try to clean them, you're going to take that off, and they're going to end up looking like any other B8 symbol. You know, they're going to be gotcha. orange. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's so don't clean them or figure out a solution to not. Yeah, yeah I mean, you could do stuff with, with soap and water where you just basically get rid of the dirt and oil, and you're not doing anything abrasive. You know, but that kind of sure. is to save it for later for the cleaning that sure. section. Sure. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I've seen, and uh, I actually was just looking the other night. Um, there's a listing in, on, uh, I think it's German eBay. A guy's guy's got a 20 inch giant beat, a white label, and he's asking six hundred dollars for it. And I actually I actually saved the pictures because it's got all this edge damage, just big old chunks on the edge where it's been something's fallen on it or he's dropped it on something. Wow. I mean, and the bell has got dings in it where you know he probably dropped the symbol upside down on something. I mean, he did yeah. it, but somebody in the past did. Yeah, yeah. And I've noticed this a lot with especially with giant beats, is they just get beat up. And uh, it's just to me, I mean, they're really cool symbols. I, I really like the reissues, actually. I think they're really cool because I played 2002s my whole life. So Giant Beasts are kind of the kinder, gentler 2002. Um, <laughs> you know, they're mellower like I am with age, you know? Yeah, yeah. They 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 mellow out a little bit. You, yeah. you, it's a nice option to. Yeah. Yeah. But, but it's just, I mean, I would just be very careful if, if you're, because the majority of Giant Beasts you're going to find are in Europe. I'd be very careful and making sure you get really good pictures of the edge. Look at what kind of okay. damage there is. Um, like mandatory, you got to get them to send you a video, right, of a, of a recording so you can see what it sounds like at least. So you get an idea. Because sure. the problem yeah. is, is you're going to pay five, six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars for these things. Yeah. And if you're paying two hundred bucks for a symbol and it turned out to be kind of clunker, it's like, well, okay. That happened to me a lot where I was paying a hundred, hundred fifty dollars for these symbols. And I would just turn around and sell them for a hundred bucks or eighty dollars, and I'd lose like twenty or thirty dollars. But I'm like, you know what? You tried and you experienced it. And, yeah, and yeah. it's an eighty dollars symbol. I mean, I didn't try to rip somebody off. I sold them for what I thought it was worth. You know, it's okay, but it's not great. Yeah. You know. Uh, another thing about okay. giant beats is they were never made in the German plant. Um, they were only Swiss made. Um, they also never got the Peisty outline stamp on the bottom of the symbol, the famous Peisty name. I don't know why, but they never they they just they didn't put them on there. Um, what's interesting is during this period of time, you had a parallel up to seventy four. I remember asking Freddie, I'm like, why did they keep making giant beats until seventy four? If two thousand twos came out in seventy one, because in seventy four, well, from sixty seven to seventy four, but especially seventy one to seventy four, you had two thousand two, you had the giant beat, you had the Stambul sixty five. Right, you had the B8 Stambul, you had the Dixie, you had the 602, and then you had the Super. So Pisces wow. was making five different lines or seven different lines of symbols. Tons of lines. Yeah, too many. 
Right. Yeah. And that's another thing that I never mentioned was, you know, up until 1981, Zilchin only made one line of symbols. And, and again, with, with the way things are nowadays, I mean, there's so many choices. You've got a trillion, you know, little boutique Turkish brands coming out of you know, Turkey. Um, you've got, you know, Paul Francis, you know, Matt Bettis, guys like that yeah. that are making these hands. Tons of small right? builders, yeah. You know, and then you've got the big four. Um, I mean, it's drummers don't understand that there's a period really from like the mid 60s to when Sabian was allowed to sell in the US in 82, 81. 82 or 83 or something. Yeah. yeah 81, 82, yeah. 83. Yeah. There was, you only had two choices, you know? It was like, it was like you basically Ford or Chevy. It's like Pisces or Zildjian. That's all there was. Yep. But, yep. Pisces would offer, you know, because that was one of their fortes, was all these lower echelon lines that were cheaper. And you didn't have to buy an entry level symbol. You could buy an upper mid level symbol that was basically like 80% of, of, of a 2002, you know, yeah. but substantially cheaper. So you could get that really good sound, but, you know, something you could afford. So the one thing I wanted to say about Giant Beats also that uh, I keep forgetting about, and I didn't even put it in my notes, was. Story from Mr. Fritz, one of, one of his early stories he told me. How did Giant Beats get reissued? Why did Pisces reissue it, right? So the story goes, there's a drummer in Germany, I think it owns a drum shop in, in northern Germany, and he's this fanatical Bonham fan. I forget his name, but he is the one that bugged Eric over and over and over and sent him emails and bugged him and bugged him about getting Bonham's endorsement contract. And that huh. endorsement contract you see on Pisces' website of Bonham yeah, yeah. was because this guy kept bugging Eric and he wanted to wow. see it. So Eric had to go and find it in some old file cabinet somewhere, you know, in a storeroom. And he had to dig Talking it up. about history. Yeah. And he dug it up and now it's all over the internet, you know. Yeah, um, really. The other thing this guy did was he also requested a custom order and he wanted a full set of giant beats. And I think Pisces recently put a pause on custom orders, but the rule of thumb is there's a very long delay because they have to stop production. And what they do is I'm sure that they wait until they're, they're ready for a switchover. They'll wait till they're done with a run of a whole line of symbols, which could take months. And when they're going to switch over all of their tooling for another series, that's when they'll run down the line those symbols for the custom order. And the rule of thumb is you got to buy two of everything. So if you order a full set of giant beats, you got to you got to buy two full sets. Wow. So, so this guy's expensive. This guy orders them. Yeah. Pisces makes them. They're in the vault. And Steve Jordan is visiting Notwell. And he's going through the factory. And I guess he's in the vault or whatever. And he sees him. He's like, hey, what are these? It's like, wh when did you guys start making these? And they're like, well, we're not. It's a custom order. He's like, hey, I want some. So <laughs> they, they made two sets for Steve Jordan. Steve Jordan brings it back to LA. And all his buddies are like, dude, where'd you get those? Dude, I want some. So they started bugging Pisces. And I guess there was enough of demand. It was really this German guy, but also Steve Jordan, that kicked off this demand for giant beats. So I just said, okay, I guess there's Crazy. enough of demand. Wow. We'll start making them again. Yeah. So, yeah. Jeez. That's awesome. You wonder <laughs> sometimes when things are discontinued, like, you know, there's a reason to discontinue them. 2002s came out. It was kind of redundant to a degree, but like things get new life now. It would be a totally different, you yeah. know, people would love it. It's awesome. Now what Pisces does, and this is in my, on the wiki page about the civil production process and, and, Zildjian and Sabian do the same thing. They, they have what's called, I think they call it a mother. But uh, uh, with Paiste, it's called a Klang Musta, which is <laughs> master symbol in German. I guess Klang uh, means symbol. <laughs> yeah. So they have the, the master symbol, and that's what they test all other symbols against. So what they would have done is they would have put that master away, the giant bead masters from 1974. They just would have put them in the vault, and they've been sitting there since. So when Pisces will reissue, and they say thing with the 602s, you know, they had all the old master symbols, all the all the old clang musters from 94, because that's when they stopped producing 602. So they brought them out and they started going to, to producing these symbols, and it probably took a little while 
to get the hammer and leaving correct to get the sound. But all they had to do was compare it against the master, and and it was hit or mm. miss how close they were. And if it wasn't close enough, then you know, then, then do it again. Yeah. So that's how they're able to 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 reissue these symbols. That's awesome. Very yeah. good to know. Yeah. Okay. Big one. Two thousand twos. What can I say about two thousand twos that hasn't already been said? You know. Um, yeah. The one thing you know you know basically being old now <laughs> is i grew up with the sound and what I, I i tell people a lot is turn on doesn't matter where you live in the u.s every city's got a classic rock station right turn yeah. on a classic rock station and i guarantee you if, the, if it's not the song that's playing the next song the drummer will be playing 2002s 2002s com- you know, I'm not exaggerating. They changed the sound of music. You know, the way sure. I I like to I I like to say the the way that Avidus Zildjian changed jazz music with their symbols, with the design, right, with hi hats and the def, the actual names, crash ride and hi hat, right? Yeah. I mean, they they changed the sound of modern music, which was big band jazz in thirties and forties yep. and fifties. Right. I personally feel Pisces did the same thing with rock music in the seventies. And it's, yeah. you know, I was, would always say, Oh, it's you know, English rock drummers. But the more I looked, I realized there was a lot of American drummers in the seventies that were playing Pisces. So real quick, I'm going to go down just, just a, a little list I put together. This is only seventies, not eighties, not nineties. Of course, Buona. Mm-hmm. Alex Van Halen from the very first album. Cozy Powell, who played with Jeff Beck and Richie Blackbird's Rainbow. Uh, Carl Palmer, of course. He actually played 602s early on. Um, Ian Pace, of course. Um, Karan Apice, Carmine. Not only did he play Giant Beast, but he also played 2002s in what he was with Rod Stewart. And yeah. also with Beck Bogart and Apice. Um, Mooney. Um, who by numbers is 2002s and that tour? Um, the last time we did a Who Are You, he went to A Zildjian's, and you could hear it, you could see it in the videos. But that mid period, um, he's playing 2002s. Um, Ainsley Dunbar with Journey and and uh, Jefferson uh, Jefferson Starship was playing 2002. The big one, which freaks everybody out, is Steve Smith played 2002s when he was in Journey. And that was Journey Evolution, the first album we did with Journey in 79. Those are all 2002s with sound creation, dark sound edge hi-hats, and a 24-inch A Zildjian ping ride. Hmm. And Mix and match. Yeah. He, I, I, I bought his Kindle, and he went through all his gear and explained what happened. And he played 2002s for about three years, uh, 76, 77, 79, when he was with Jean-Luc Pony, then with Ronnie Montrose, and then recorded the first uh, Journey album, Evolution, the first album he uh, played on and, and toured with. By the time you get to uh, Departure in 80, he's back to, he got he got his uh, A Zildjian endorsement. But he said that Paiste was the first company to offer him an endorsement. He was in Europe with Jean-Luc Pony, and they were in Switzerland. I think they're in Montreux. And he went to the factory, and they're like, here you go. And they gave him just a huge boatload of symbols. You know, and he was, you know, a young, aspiring drummer. He wasn't a big name. So, you know, th- this is yeah. a time when, when Zildjian wouldn't give an endorsement and Peisty would. And he, he explains that in his book, you know. Wow. Um, yeah. I mean, that's, but all of these are like the sound of the radio. Yeah. I mean, that is yeah. incredible. I, I'd say they don't get enough credit for that. I mean, I think you've talked about it in your, the first episodes you did. Yeah. I think that was the, we talked about this in part two, but like, uh, it's incredible. It really is. 2002s are everywhere. Yeah. Um, a, a very little known drummer. There's an band, English band called UFO. A real famous guitarist, Michael Schenker. Their drummer, Andy Parker, played 2002s. One of the best live albums ever, if you like 70s rock. It's called Strangers of the Night by UFO. It's an amazing live album. Amazing sounded drums. Andy's playing White Vista Light Ludwig drum set in 2002s. Nice. We're Graham Lear from Santana. So Graham Lear is a drummer that replaced Michael Shreve in the mid seventies, and he mm. played two thousand twos. So the sound of Santana from nineteen seventy to like nineteen eighty 
with 602s and 2002s. That's what the two Germans were playing, believe it or not. Um, mm. And then you've got Jethro Tull, and all of Tull's drummers have played Paiste for forever. Um, Barrymore Barlow was playing 2002s, and all the classic mid to late 70s uh, uh, Jethro Tull albums, and then Mark Craney in the, in the early 80s, and then Don Perry. By then, I think Do- he, was, he was getting in like 3000s. Uh, Charlie Watts. Now, with Charlie, it was only here and there. He used a 20-inch medium as a ride all through the 70s and the early 80s. So, mm. But I consider, okay, he played 2002s. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, Dennis Elliott and Foreigner. So all those big hits from Foreigners in the late 70s, those were all 2002s. Uh, Kenny Jones, when he was in the Faces, um, in the Small Faces, he played 2002s. Now, when he joined the Who in 79, he started. He switched to Zildjian's, just, just to be fair. Michael, yeah, yeah. Michael DeRosier from Heart, all of those Heart albums all through the 70s and early 80s were 2002s. And he was replaced by Denny Carmassi, that was he was playing Roods in 2002s. Phil Rudd with ACDC, 2002s. Roger Taylor. Now, to be fair, Roger was 50-50. The left side was 2002s. The right side of his set were A's Zildjian's. Just, just, mm. just to be completely fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Stan Lynch with Tom Petty. All of those late 70s hits, those were all 2002s. Uh, Chester Thompson was originally with Frank Zappa. He was playing 2002s. And then with Genesis 2002s and Sound Creations. Simon wow. Kirk with Bad Company, 2002s. Nick Mason, of course, 2002s, right? Yep. Don yep. Hanley with the Eagles, 2002s. Hotel California, all those giant hits by the Eagles, those are all 2002s. Uh, Jerry mm. Shirley with Humble Pie. You say, well, who's Humble Pie? Humble Pie was the band that Peter Frampton was in before he went solo. Early 70s, hard rock English band, really good band. Mick mm. Fleetwood, once 2002s came out, he, he dropped his 602s and played 2002s all through the 70s, all through the 80s, into the 90s. Uh, Paul Thompson with Roxy Music, 2002s. Bobby mm. Elliott with The Hollies, 2002s. And last but not least, Phil E. Hart with Kansas. Carry on my wayward son, 2002s. All the big Kansas hits, 2002s. That's quite the list. And these are all being distributed by Rogers, CBS era Rogers. That is truly the the sound of the 70s. And and those are only the drummers that I can actually find pictures of them actually playing 2002s. There's a lot more. Those are just the ones where... Because I put this on the wiki, so I wanted to have pictures. You can clearly see the symbols. It's like, yes. And, of course, my, yeah. my favorite picture of all time is Steve Smith. Because Steve Smith is basically, it's Steve Smith and Bonham. And then Ginger yeah. Baker yeah, and yeah. Stuart Copeland for me. It's like tied for yeah. first, tied for second. You know? <laughs> Interesting. And and I'm I'm looking at your outline here, and I, I just, I've always wondered about, God, what does 2002 come from? And it says right here, named after Robert's BMW 2002, yeah. which is fascinating, which is an iconic, awesome little car. I mean, that's P- a really cool BMW. Yeah. The, the Pisces always claims that it was like a futuristic name. It wasn't. Rob, and Robert named it after his car. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, so yeah. To, to wrap it up, uh, German 2002s, um, my understanding is they produce them all the way through 86. And with the red labels, it's very easy to tell. And I've got a picture where you see this big old made in Germany on the, on the red label. It's harder to tell, but on the emboss and metal stamp on the 70s, 2002s, it'll say made in Germany. As, instead of where it would normally say made in Switzerland. Sometimes it's hard to read. Is um, that more collectible or less collectible because it would be German? I mean... You know, it's... It's an oddity. I, I have one. Okay. I, I would like to buy more. Actually, Raphael is selling a German, an 18-inch German 2002 China type on Facebook right now. Raphael gotcha. Zimmerman. Raphael Zim- Zimmerman, yeah. who's a great, awesome guy. Yeah. Very knowledgeable. Yeah, he's actually, like I was saying earlier, if you get on Facebook, he actually does a lot of sales. He, he Him and I talk a lot. He, he lives in Switzerland, and he actually buys a lot of stuff, and he sells directly to, to drummers on Facebook in the U.S. So, and he try he he sells a lot of 2002s and a lot of sound creations, and they're all from Europe. So he's yeah. a really good source of if if you get on one of those forums, you know, like the the, the, the Peisty New and Vintage forum, find Raphael and contact him. If if you're looking for a particular symbol, ask him. 
he could probably find it for you. You know, he also sells yeah. signatures. You know, I think a lot of it is, you know, you know what he can find and, and what's what's in good shape, you know. But it makes it much easier trying to get stuff from Europe if you're if you're going through an intermediary like he like him. Sure. Um so to wrap up 2002s, um, we could talk about 1986. Kind of like George Orwell's 1984, but for Pisces it was 1986. So what happened in 1986 was um there was a big paradigm shift with Paiste and they changed all their lower lines. And I'll get into kind of the collectible lower lines in, in, a, in a minute. But what Pisces did is, is, and this is an interview I read with the Thomas Pisces in Modern Drummer. And he stated that one of the reasons they phased out the 404 and the 505, especially the 505, was it was, they were, I don't know if they were losing money. He doesn't say that. But I have a feeling that they weren't making any money off of it. It was too expensive to produce for what they were charging. Hmm. And it, I'll get into 505s in a little bit. But in 86 is when they wiped out all those lower lines and they brought in the 3000 series, the 2000, the 1000, the 400, and the 200. So what you get with the 1000, which is basically the 404 replacement, is you get a symbol that is now pressed or stamped into shape with hammering. But... They made a rude version. You could tell it's not nearly enough hammering to shape the symbol. You know, it's the hammer is much too sparse. So I'm I'm educated guess that those were stamped into shape, and then the 400 and 200 were definitely stamped into shape. And I think even the hammer marks may have been pressed in. It was much much oh, more. Wow. Yeah, I mean this is and this is going with you know because they were. You know, Pisces has the ability to make a decent sounding symbol, even if it's basically completely the manufacturing's automated. And that was yeah, yeah. that was the big shift was they ha- they basically had to, you know, because by the time you get in eighty six, they had massive competition from Sabian. And I have to say, so many of these seventies drummers, they all got poached by Se- by Sabian by the mid eighties. You know, Phil Collins, yeah. Chester Thompson. Those guys Jack got poached. Dejanet. Yeah, those guys got poached. You know, Ainsley went, yeah. to, went to Zildjian. Uh, I mean, I could go on and on and on. Phil Ehart was playing Zildjian, you know. At any rate, you know, they, they had some, there was a third player. And, you know, Sabian, I, I, from what I could tell, really blew up. I remember their ads. And it's like, who are these guys? It's like, oh, they're like Zildjian Mark II. It's like, oh, this is weird, you know. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Yeah, that it was a weird, uh, but... You don't see many people. It's like car companies where one doesn't really come out of the the woodwork very often, but then you find out, oh, they're owned by this massive company, or yeah, in that case, oh, they're run by Robert Zildjian. It's just a family thing. So it's, yeah. it's yeah, they they knew what they were doing already. So to transition into the three thousands, what happened with the two thousand twos is they weren't officially uh, discontinued in eighty six, but I see. I, I found the ad where I remember sitting in Modern Drummer, where they show the 2002s in the drink. It's literally like being dropped in the water. And then the 3000 is like sailing above like this ocean, all shiny. And the 2002 is like dumped in the ocean, like sinking. It's like, you got to be kidding me, man. Really? It's your own symbol. Like, yeah. don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. yeah. So Literally. Yeah. So, you know, uh, but what I found out talking to Mr. Fritz was that the uh, and I remember this period because I had loaned my symbols to my buddy who was like a Tommy Lee, you know, wannabe, and he cracked my eighteen inch medium. Two thousand two. Yeah. So wow. And he couldn't he couldn't replace it, so he replaced it with a three thousand one, an eighteen inch three thousand. To to be clear, what happened was was that Pisces actually never stopped producing two thousand twos. They scaled way back, way back. They stopped advertising two thousand twos. But they still listed them in, in dealer catalogs. So in their their catalog, the, the catalog that that the public would see would not list them, right? Their marketing and all that kind of stuff. But the dealer, the drum shop, when they got the next year, right, with the new the new retail list prices and all that kind of stuff, they would still list them in the back or whatever. So you, they could still order them, but it was kind of you know. And my understanding was that yeah. there's this huge knee-jerk reaction with drummers in general, where it's like, wait a second, there's just all this huge upsurge of demand because all of a sudden 2002s 
were being discontinued. So there's this huge demand. So Pisces basically kind of forced to go back and start to produce more again when they're trying to focus on the 3000. Now, the, the 3000, Robert has always believed from, but this is, this is talking to Mr. Fritz and, and I think also Freddie that Robert has always tried to strive forward. And, and I understand his ideology and that what he's trying to do is he's trying to create uh, symbols to match, to keep pace with the pace of music evolution. And as music yeah. changes, he's trying to change the symbols to keep up or maybe even stay ahead. You know, and he did that with the giant beat. He did that with the 2002, right? Well, Successfully, which worked. Right. And yeah. that was his idea with the 3000 was now you're into the second half of the 80s. You got hair metal. You know, it's music is even more amplified, even louder, even more. Just when you listen to music from the era, it's like super bright. The drums sound like cannons, you know, like a, yeah, like yeah. shotguns, you know, yes. all this tons of reverb. So yep. he basically, the 3000 was a 2002 on steroids. that had this kind of odd flat lathing, which carried over to the signature series. The bells were larger. And they sounded different. They were they were more aggressive. They had a stronger mid range, just more of everything. All the drummers used them. All the endorsers. I remember all the advertisement. You know, Alex Van Halen was using them for all, all the Van Hager albums. You know, but they just they didn't sell the way two thousands and it did. And the two you just there was this you know kind of resistance of people still wanted two thousand twos. So. Pisces, you know, re reluctantly, you know, brought back 2002s. Um, I, I, I'd have to look up on the wiki. Maybe it was 89 when they actually started advertising again. And then they were called yeah. the 2002 Classic or Classic 2002. I get the need to, like, come out with new things, but you, you always look back and go, oh, we shouldn't have done that. But yeah. they had to try. Whatever. Yeah. Well, it, it was, you know, it, it was, you know, he always trying to move forward to, to, to stay, you know, you have to keep advancing to basically keep up, you know? Yeah, well, exactly what you said before yeah. about, yeah. you know, if it worked, we'd be going, man, what a great idea, yeah. but yeah, and, and, tried. And, and what happened was, was three years later, Robert came out with the signature series, what, with with the whole new alloy that he, he that he developed basically himself, you know, with, with the help yeah. of, a, of a metallurgist. And that was really the death knell to the 3000, because now that you had the signatures, it was like, signatures of 2002s, you know, nobody wants a 3000. So, it, it's i don't know the exact date they're discontinued it's on the wiki but i don't think they lasted much past the early 90s so they only really had maybe a six-year run and then that's it and collectability wise yeah. you know there's a few people that re that really like them and are, are like desperately trying to basically collect the whole catalog they're hard to find and when you do find them a lot of times they're really beat up because they're rock symbols you know just like giant beats sure. you know but 2002s yeah, they made so many that there was a good chance you're going to find some. The other thing that I kind of forgot to mention about 2002 was that Freddie was the, was involved in the second half of the development because he was there in '70 and he worked with Robert. You know, it, it started with Pierre in '70 and Pierre left halfway through and and, brought, and Freddie came in. So Freddie was involved with the development in 2002, and he told me that. That it wasn't necessarily a rock symbol because Freddie was a jazz fusion guy, and he said that 2002s were not just rock but also jazz fusion symbols. So it was it wasn't just this one niche that they were looking at, which I never knew. Yeah. So and if you look yeah. at these old videos from 72, 73, 74, you see bands like Soft Machine, which are like hardcore, like jazz fusion. The guy's playing 2002s, you know? He's not playing yeah. 602s. Yeah, so it's, yeah, whereas 3000s are something heavier, few, more in the 80s, you're not seeing that. No. You're not seeing the crossover. No, yeah. And, and yeah, and by then, it's like you've got the whole, whole you know, EAK, right? Early American K Revolution, you know, that mm -hmm. came back with, with, with the, you know, with, with, as a force in like 82, 83, you know? Yeah. So, okay. So the last real big one, and there's a, super hardcore following for sound creations i owned a few i have to say that sound creation chinas are my absolute favorite i absolutely love them and the funny thing is they look exactly like a zildjian swish but they don't sound like it 
you know i mean they're, they're similar sort of a low low taper on the the edges really, not, not very really dramatic. small bill and yeah when you know pikes came out with the with the uh with the modern essentials right 602s you know the vini, vini caliuta symbols which again that was freddy freddy actually freddy introduced vini to those they were developing them there's a there's a i didn't conduct the interview but i i edited this i have a little snapshot of an, a part of an interview where he talks about that where he had um shown the modern essentials to vinnie and that was part of the enticement to get vinnie to endorse Pisces. i mean that was huge because vinnie had played zildjian and what was ironic in that interview was freddie said that vinnie had originally applied for an endorsement and vinnie and simon phillips had applied for endorsement in 78 or basically accepted and they were going to be endorsees in 1978 when when Vinny was with Frank Zappa, and I don't know who Simon was with in, in 78. And at the last minute, they got shut down because I guess Peisty was, they, they had over uh, 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 extended themselves. And they, I mean, from what I remember, they had too many endorsees. So there's basically, they had to cut off any new endorsees that they'd already engaged Jeez. or whatever. So Freddie had to write both those guys letters saying, I'm sorry, but we can't, we can't, you can't be an endorsee, you know? And they basically turned them down after they'd already gone through the whole process. What, what, the one I'm getting with the modern sessions before I get too far off uh, is when I looked at their, their Chinas, I'm like, oh my God, those are sound creations. The, the 602 modern essential Chinas are sound creation dark Chinas. The hammering is a little different, exact same bells, exact same taper, the curve, you know? I'm like, they took, they took the old side creation China and they probably took the clang muster and they, they tweaked it a little bit and it created a slightly different version. And that's what they presented to Vinny. Cause I remember watched the Vinny episode or video like 50 times where he talks about when he first auditioned the modern essentials and he gave him all these suggestions for the symbols, but with the Chinese symbols is just do your thing. I know you're going to produce something great. So yeah, that's something uh, to consider when you're looking at sound creations is possibly a modern essential instead. Um, the thing about sound creations from that era, all right, really any era from 78 to 94 is they are insanely expensive. And I looked this up last night. I have a, uh, I have a Rogers price sheet from 1980. So sound creation 20 inch bell ride list is $475 in 1980. All right. Wow. And I did yeah. a conversion. I went to the, to the dollar, you know, year calculator. Yeah, yeah. And I yeah. put how much is four hundred seventy five dollars and twenty twenty three dollars? One thousand seven hundred and forty nine. Jeez. So that symbol in the conversion would have equal that would be today buying a symbol for seventeen fifty. Seventeen oh my god. That list price for a twenty two inch bell ride would be seventeen fifty. Or a twenty two inch bell never dark heard ride. of it. A new symbol being a used symbol may yeah. be rare, but I've never heard of a, a new symbol, even like like a boutique brand being that much money. Oh yeah, people think Pisces are expensive now. Ima I imagine how much. And the, you're also because you're also dealing with with the Swiss franc, so the exchange rate uh, varies quite a bit, and depending yeah. on the U.S. economy, you know, eighty was not a good year. We had a really bad recession, and we had really high inflation. And 79 and 80. So what happened is the value of the dollar dropped a lot, which meant that Pisces w went through the roof, you know, because it's the exchange okay. rate a lot. Of, it's some of it, some of it's exchange rate. So are these are there less of these in the market because oh, people yeah. couldn't afford them back then? Yeah, and that's they probably just, I mean, the kicker. Yeah, I mean, they were super expensive. Um, they, they, you know, originally they only made 18, 20, 22. They made 14 inch high hats. They made 18, inch, 18 and 20 inch dark crashes, and they made a couple IDs like a like a, a mellow ride and like a bright ride, and then you had the 20 and 22 inch dark rides and 20 and 22 inch bell rides. Um, I think you had 18, 20, 22 chinas, um, but yeah, I mean the the line was always very limited. A large portion of the symbols were a takeoff on. They were based around Freddie's dark ride, and Freddie obviously was very heavily involved in the development of the whole whole line. Now there are other sure. models like the short crash, which is really, really strange. And I, I had one, I had an 18. It has a flat bell. So it has a normal bell, but it looks like it's been cut off on the top. It's very, it's very strange. And years later, 
with um, some formula, they made what was called the crystal crashes, and they used the same bell. So, very, very, very interesting symbols. Um, yeah. If, if yeah. you want to, if you want to hear sound creations, go to Daniel Plasco's uh, YouTube page, and he's got every sound creation you can imagine. He's got a video of it, and a lot of times he'll do comparisons, like he'll do Dark China's like eighteen twenty twenty two, and he'll just go back and forth between all three of them. It's really good for yeah get an idea of what they sounded like um that's a good it's good to know a trusted source of yeah of where to hear these kind of sounds because yeah. even if you're not gonna go out and buy one it's f fun to listen to and hear what they sound like just to know the history of our instrument yeah. you know, and all the different brands on, on the whole they're expensive they're they're yeah. some of them are giant beat territory some of them aren't you know it, it depends okay. on the seller um there are some here in the U.S. Um, they tend to be usually more expensive here in the U.S. Um, probably the <laughs> best, best bet is to go is to hit up Raphael and say, "Hey, man, find me some sound creations." I actually yeah. just I actually just bought one. I just bought a, a twenty Dark China from him. Like literally, wow. I paid him yesterday for it. Oh, so, nice. and it's a it's a seventy eight. It's an eighty, so it's, it still has the old black label ink in it. Uh, same thing cool. with with the, uh, up to 81, they had the metal stamp or emboss, and then in 81, they went to, it wasn't color, it was black, but they had that, the sound, the sound creation logo was very cool, a kind of almost like a bursting star. They always have cool, I, I like all the star and the, the rays yeah. and the things like that, which is important. It does matter. It doesn't affect the sound yeah. really, but that's, that's just a cool, it's cool imagery. The, the, um, the, the progeny. Of the sound creation series and this is i remember this is not not my interview but again another interview i read with freddie is the master series that that is the modern that the ultimate version of what pisces was trying to achieve 45 years ago with that dark complex you know a uh, sound it had, they they've achieved it with the masters series really yeah okay so i cool. I, I thought the modern modern essentials were more sound creationist, but but according to the Freddie interview, it's the Masters was their ultimate. That's that's what Freddie was always looking for, you know, it's str or striving yeah. to achieve all these decades. Yeah, you know that sound. And with modern technology, I guess, and and things like that, they can. Well, it's or experience. It's and, it's the alloy, you know. And going back to the end of the, uh, of the first of the, the last episode, it's because those symbols, the alloy is rolled in Turkey. And that's how they're uh, able to get that I sound. You, I see. You can't, you can't get that really dissonant, dark, trashy sound with Wyland Works B twenty. It's too clean, and it's it's too, it's too pristine and accurate. The way that the alloy is produced, it's yeah. very, very consistent. And you need those irregularities. You literally, it's the crudeness of production of of of, yeah. of, of mixing pouring, casting, and then rolling that causes that complex sound that you get. I mean, yeah. And the other sound is like, I was almost saying like, it's too peisty, where they're like yeah. perfect and clean and sharp yeah. in a good way. But but if you want yep. a little bit of that yep. flavor, yep. you got to go, yep. you got to get dirty. And, and you can hear with the sound creation series, you can hear with the heavy hammer and it's a darker symbol, but yeah. it's they're not K's Elgin's, not, not by a long shot. They're still really cool sounding symbols, but they it's the alloy. And same thing with the modern essentials. I really like the modern essentials. I think they're really cool. You know, if if I could afford, I would buy like every model. But again, it's you know, you, you compare the modern essentials to the masters, they're a mile apart. They're both complex and darker sounding symbols, but the the modern essentials is still got that sweet almost kind of, it's, it's it still has that sweet fruity tinge that 602s have that the masters mm. don't you know yeah so to wrap up the sound creations 84 is when they added the new dimensions and they took they took some of the symbols the the dark crashes the dark ride the bell ride the, the chinas and they created a new dimension version short crashes too because my short crash is in a new dimension. I had a bell ride, and that was a new dimension. The hammering changed, and the hammering was was heavier on the Mark One series. 
and the new dimensions, they, I remember Daniel Plasco called it the golf ball hammer marks because the hammer marks are really big. They're like almost an inch in diameter. It looks to me, I, I don't, I'd have to <laughs> have a set of creation with me so I can't look at it, unfortunately. Yeah. But sure. I think they use two different sized hammer heads because I think there's two different size hammer marks on them. They do sound quite different. I actually like the new dimensions. They, Pisces and their literature says that they're more refined um, and they do sound different. The China sound different. The, the, the bell rides and the dark rides definitely sound different. And Daniel Plasco has both and he has videos where he does side by side mark ones against new dimensions. So you could literally, he'll just go back and forth between two symbols. You see exactly the difference in how they sound. So mm, that's you know, interesting. Yeah, yeah. If, if you're if you're interested in something unique that is darker sounding and less peisty like, then the sound creations are definitely worth checking out. The dark crashes are pretty cool. They're hard to find. The rides are easier to hard to are easy to find. The hi hats are easy to find. If you want to you want to hear what dark what sound creation hi hats sound like, listen to Journey Evolution. Because Steve Smith is playing sound creation dark sound edges on that album. Mm. And you can hear them. The last, That's awesome. The last track in the album called Lady Luck, which is like the super hard rocking song. The intro is where he's playing just as high and opening it up and closing it, going like that. And it's like, yeah. Yeah. Those are dark sound edges. Well, at that point, it would have been brand new, too. So you got to think that then there's also the aging of a symbol, which would affect how it is now. But that's a different. That's. Yeah. And just go hear it for yourself if you can, I guess. Yeah. And I think I mentioned in the first episode that I think that that B20. A just better. It's more durable than B8 is. Yeah, that's cool. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So okay. I think we're basically, we're getting towards the end here of the lines and I go through the, what I think are collectible lower lines. So these might be considered more like, you know, someone who's not like have having someone source symbols in Europe that are so rare that like getting them sent to your house, these would almost be more attainable for someone who's got a little extra dough to spend. Yeah. I want to get a cool vintage yeah. Peisty symbol. These could be attainable, yeah. right? Yeah. Okay. So um, again, with the Facebook pages, like the Peisty new and vintage, um, there's a guy a week ago uh, uh, from England. He's selling, um, I think it's a pair of hi hats. I can't remember, but I, I commented on it. He's selling a pair of black label five hundred fives, and I remember the price was, was very reasonable. I can't remember exactly what it was, but we're talking like one hundred fifty, two hundred bucks, maybe, maybe less. Wow, that's good. Maybe closer to like the one hundred fifty range. Um, but with five hundred fives, you're only going to see the green labels. It started like mid eighty one. Um, four hundred four and five hundred fives are very hit and miss. Be- because they were kind of four fours were really beginner symbols, they get pretty beat up and they're thin. Yeah. You know? Um, but you'll find some where it's just they haven't really been played much. And you could tell. You could tell by they still have the labels, they're not super dirty, they're not all banged up, the edges are straight. Well, that's the other side of beginner symbols is yeah, they were either beaten to death or they were not used at all because yeah. little Jimmy didn't actually play his drum set yeah. at all. And then it went into a attic or something. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Five, 505s. I've seen some in really good condition. And I would say that they are, are 505s were like 85% of a 2002 as far as like sound quality and like construction. You know, I, I owned, you know, back in 82 cruising sunset strip going to guitar center. You know, I bought a pair of 505 hi-hats and an 18-inch China to go with my 16 and 18-inch 2002 mediums and my 22-inch ride. And it was a perfect mix. The 505s nice. were a little cheaper, so I was able to afford the hi-hats and the China within like a month or two of each other, you know? So I yeah. had a cool set, yeah. you know? And then I could play Rush Signals and I could, you know, I could totally perfectly emulate Niels Wuhan with my 18-inch 505 China. Yeah. That's some realistic. We've all been there though, where you're like, all right, a China, if I can't afford it, I'm going to buy the cheaper, like Zildjian ZBT or like the Wuhan yeah. because they're dirt cheap yeah. and it's not your ride. It's yeah. not your crash. You can get away with a little more. Yeah. Yeah. So those are, those are the other big thing too with both of them, even the 404 and uh, Big JD, John De Christopher has got a couple 404s, believe it or not. I told him he, he did a podcast 
probably like three or four months ago or something, five months ago on the symbol collection. And I messaged him afterwards and I said, hey, I said, your 404s are actually really cool. You know, they're they're pretty rare. He had two 20 inch rides, which are really more like crashes because they're 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 relatively thin. Um, they still had the full ink, you know. I said, You're, these things are really wow. good shape. I said, listen, both of those lines, those are the last lower level lines or mid level lines that were fully hammered into shape. 404s were fully hammered into shape, which means that like I would say 75% of the labor went to those that produced a 2002. You know, the, the big difference that I see with them is the lathing. The lathing is very, very simple on 404s. Yeah. Where with 2002s, you have two layers. You have a fine layer and you have a coarse layer that's asymmetrical. That almost looks like record grooves. That kind of gets tighter and spreads out. Then it gets tighter and spreads out. And with the 505, you have the fine lathing and then have the coarse lathing layer over it but it's consistent and it's just like a big you know it's a big gap between the, yeah the grooves yeah. but that's where they save money to make it right because affordable it's, yeah it's one pass and it's a one quick pass instead of the guy having to sit there you know so yeah you yeah know, makes sense yeah with 404 it's just one pass it's one lady pass all the way down you know so you know i mean and, and it, the other thing too that's really good about the series is that they're cheap enough that if you buy one and don't like it, it's like, okay, this is like 125 bucks. It's like throw on reverb, yeah. sell for a hundred bucks. It's like, okay, that was a $25 lesson. You know? Exactly. That's how I look at it where I remember buying a $20, a 20 or $30 ride at a pawn shop that was like dead. And I believe in the Zildjian one, Vincent mentioned that it, it sounded to me like it, he said symbols that have gone through fires or oh, something yeah. have a certain sound of just being like this symbol had nothing to it. There was just, it was gone, whatever happened to it. Yeah. It was a lesson. It's, it was a lesson learned for $30. It's been, you know? it's been annealed because it got hot yeah. enough that it reached this, what's called this recrystallization point where it's yes. not molten, but the crystalline structure changes and it basically yeah. symbol loses its hardness. And then it, so that means it loses all its sustain and tone. Yeah. It was dead. Yeah. yeah. The only, the only other note that I would add is, is, and I've never owned them, but Corey Missouri, because I, as I mentioned in the first episode, he was a big time collector of Dimensions. Dimensions was the second time that Robert tried to replace the 2002 in about, in about 2000, the year 2000. And it, according to Mr. Fritz, it was called Project Fusion. And this is, this is my interpretation of what I've read about this is the Dimensions line is not only ro- really kind of Robert's last hurrah, I mean, reintroducing, reintroducing the 602, so that was the last thing he did. But this was his last big one. And this, to me, is the pinnacle of B8 development, where he really just went out in outer space with these. And there's actually two ones, the, the, the dimensions and the innovations. And they're, they're basically tied together. Um, the innovations... And I think some of the dimensions use what's called the sound texture formula. And what it is, is instead of lathing the symbol, they're CNC machined and they use this bit that basically ground away the symbol. From what I can tell from my machinist training, you look at the surface of the symbol and it has this weird, it's kind of rough, but it looks like something basically was grinding away at the symbol. And this was, this was the treatment they used instead of cutting lathing grooves with with a knife on a lathe they use this treatment instead and it definitely creates a different sound of the symbols they also mm. do odd stuff where they actually hammer over the lathing on a lot of this, the symbols and i think at some point uh i've got a picture or we showed a picture already of some of Corey's collection but what was sad was that this is this is very expensive to produce they have problems with production with that cnc machine and the bit wearing out or breaking and what happened is when Tumas passed away in the summer of 02, um, this, this series quickly faded away and was discontinued. This was kind of the, the, what would be called uh, the Eric era. And my understanding was that, again, like uh, with the 404 and 505, they were, they were too expensive to produce for what you know, Pisces was charging. And you can only charge what, what the market will bear, you know. And you can't charge, you know, 
the 1980s. You can't lose money. Well, and you yeah. and you can't charge sound creation prices for symbols like this. If people, yeah, drummers they can't afford it. You know, they can't afford it. So it's, you know, you, you know, it's it's what what the market demands. All right, Dan. So tell us about the European distributors, uh, which. Um, I'm looking at them. These are familiar brand names um, yeah. that we most 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 of these names have come up on the podcast before in some capacity. Yeah. Um, so tell us about it. Well, I guess I would say the the biggest one, which some people have heard of, is is Arbiter, um, Ivor Arbiter, and um, his drum shop. It was drum was a drum city. Drum drum city. Yep. And in London was the place. That's I my understanding. That, that's where Ringo bought his Ludwig drum set, and that's also yep. where he they stenciled the Beatles logo on his drum head, right? That's what I understand. And also, and, and also wrote in. And I think they made they 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 hand drew a larger Ludwig, right? Yes, logo yes, that, because it wasn't as big or it wasn't on yeah. there before. So all of that is. Yeah. There, I, there is a Arbiter Ivor Arbiter episode in the works with Bob uh, Henrit from uh, right. Yeah, England. Who knows all about it? So yeah, that's a, that's what I understand. Yeah, so he was the Pisces distributor in, in England, and I think it's probably due to him that so many English drummers played Pisces cymbals in the '60s and the '70s, keeping with with Pisces tradition of that era. Uh, Arbiter, I believe, started to distribute Pisces in '62, from the information we have, um, and uh, they. I believe from the beginning, Pisces made them a custom stamp. They made two of them. One of them was for the 602. And it says, and I've got a picture, Arbiter Custom Foreign Made from the 602. And then they also had the Stambul, which was just called the Arbiter Custom. Didn't say Stambul, just said Arbiter Custom. Um, I actually bought one recently, a 602 Arbiter. And it is really cool. It is a really good shape. It still has the, the clear coat on the bottom of the symbol. It's an amazing shape. Wow. So um, the Arbiter thing in general, with the history of what you just said about Ivor Arbiter and the Beatles and the importance yeah. of him, that adds some special uh, yeah. je ne sais quoi to that symbol. You know, yeah, they're they're hard to find. I mean, obviously, you're probably only going to find them in England. So I was very fortunate to find this one. Um, it was actually suggested by this drum dealer who was I was actually looking at. A, he had a Stimble sixty five. And he mentioned in correspondence, oh, by the way, I've got this Arbiter 602. I'm like, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so take my money. <laughs> yeah. So so they so that stamp they ran from 62, I think, to about 68. Then after 68, they reverted back to the standard uh, 602 emboss. And Arbiter carried all the the whole Pisces line. I have a 71 catalog where they carry everything, gongs, uh, orchestra symbols, you know, concert, marching, you name it. What I found was very interesting in that catalog going through it, because it's all musical instruments. They didn't carry a Zildjian's. They carried K Zildjian's in 1971. I was like, wait wow. a second. Arbiter. Yeah. It's wow, like, that's that, interesting. That's like if a guitar center didn't carry A's and they only carried K Zildjian's, you know? Yeah. Yeah, like, and that's what? getting towards the end of the K, ex K's existence yeah. as a factory, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I, so I, you know, because I'm thinking maybe that's another. Well, I know that Zildjians were a lot harder to to, to obtain in England. I mean, the whole reason why Ringo had a full set of Zildjians is because my understanding is in '64. You know, he, for for uh, Ed Sullivan, he went to Manny's in New York and he bought a whole set of Zildjians. I don't know when Arbiter stopped uh, distributing Pisces in England. Um, I know that Heyman was involved at one point, and I think Heyman was doing a dis distribution in England. And what's interesting is that in the first two Pisces Profiles books, people know what I'm talking about. It lists the endorsees. One was done in about 71, 72, and the second was done in 75. You notice that all these drummers are listed playing Heyman. It's like, why are so many drummers playing Heyman drums? It's like, hmm, must be big in Europe. Well, it wasn't. What it was was that uh, Tumas would send away a request to either the management or the drummer themselves of, of the, the endorser, say, hey, please send us a bio and then the list of your symbols of what you're using. And a lot of times the drummers would only send like their list of symbols or their management company would send, okay, this is what he's using. Yeah. So when 
when Tumas didn't have any information for the drums, they defaulted to Heyman. So <laughs> that's, that's funny. Drummer, drummer, drummer didn't play Heyman, but because he didn't tell Ice-T what they were playing, they played Heyman. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. That's kind of a default, like, yeah. e- a good ad for Heyman. Yeah, and Heyman is also part of that kind of the Dallas Arbiter whole empire. Um, yeah, and, and, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. and that actually falls in really quick. There's this oddity called a Heyman standard symbol and a Heyman phase one. And these were either, I think they're either Dixies or even Supers, which is an entry level line um, that had the Heyman stamp on it. And they were only hmm. produced for a few years from like 73 to 75. They're all B8. Um, the ones that I've seen, now there's actually a couple of them I've seen for sale with sound files. They don't sound very good. They're, they're pretty dead. Yeah. You know, it's the best way yeah. to describe them. Um, very beginner. And people can know Heyman is very famous because later it's the turret. It's the round lug. So if you see yeah. that, they're famous in their own right. But for Americans, you can go, hey, that looks like a Camco or, or a, a George DW. Way or a yeah. DW. Yeah. And then it's it's Heyman. Yeah. Yeah. There's actually, I think there's a pair of, of Heyman standard hi-hats on Reverb. I don't know if they're still there, but I remember seeing it a few weeks ago. And I'm like, wow. Because I don't think those were ever sold here in the U.S. Anyways, mm. one of the big ones early on for Pisces was Sonar. And Sonar was selling Stambouls in their catalog from about 52 up to 58. And I actually have one. That was the first symbol that Mr. Fritz gave me. That's kind of what started my whole, you know, collection obsession, you know, learning about Pisces history. Um and they had originally the, the Delta logo, which is a triangle. That's the old Sonar stamp. And then I think around 53, Sonar changed their logo to a cursive script that just says Sonar. And those Stambouls will, will have the standard Stambul stamp, but then it'll say Sonar at, I think, at 9 o'clock uh, in the cursive script. And the older ones with the Delta logo will just have that triangle logo below the Stambul. Hmm, um, that's cool. Interesting symbols, but by 58, I, Sonar, I'm actually looking at a picture. I've got a picture of their 57 catalog. Uh, they sold, I don't know if there are other brands or there are brands made from like Turco. There's a couple of other ones. Um, there was another company also, Trixon, also sold Stambouls during that era. The same, same period of time. Same thing. There were Stambouls, but it would say Trixon above the Stambul. And I actually saw mm. one on Reverb about a year ago, surprised that there was one here in the U.S. But again, yeah, it seems rare. Yeah, but again, these are nickel silver Stambul, so it's it's really just a, an oddity, you know? Yeah, it's more for fun. If you see a Trixon symbol, it's yeah. not like you're, it's going to be the best sounding thing in the world, yeah. I'm sure. So um, one of the big ones, which you actually see a lot, is what's called SISME. That's S-I-S-M-E in capital letters. And that was the Italian distributor for Paiste from the early 70s up to 1984. Now, what Paiste did, this, this I think, what SISME, I think, was the last, the last, the last distributor for Paiste. They stamped high performance above the embosser stamp. So it was 602s, it says high performance, and then the 602 stamp. And then on the bottom of the symbol in red ink, it says SISME distribution. And that, that's, that sound creation, Dark China, that I bought from Raphael, that's a SISME sound creation. Ah, so cool. it'll say high performance above the sound creation stamp. Now, I've seen 602 SISMEs and a lot of sound creation SISMEs. I've never seen a 2002 SISME. But I'm just, it, it could be that Paiste didn't modify the stamp uh, for Sisme in Italy for the 2002s. Yeah. Um, I don't know about Stambouls or 505s or 404s. I haven't seen those either. It is possible. Um, 84 uh, Italian distribution was taken over by uh, Paolo uh, uh, Sperlotti, which I think I talked about him in the first episode. Um, yeah. And once we get into that, the color label era, there was no special labeling or anything. But they're pretty common when you get on, especially like in a, in a I think I actually, one of the links uh, that I gave you was for an Italian uh, um, auction site. But even the Swiss and the Germans ones, you'll see some Sisme symbols. Um, another one we don't really see here, but if you get on Japanese eBay, Pearl was actually a, a, the Japanese distributor for Paiste from 69 to 79. 
And Pisces actually made them a custom stamp, I think, for the Dixie, where it had the, I, it's, I don't know if they used this logo in the 70s, but it was a cur- real pretty cursive yeah. pearl. Yeah. And I love that logo. Yeah, and it's big. And that's, that's, and now the 602s, I don't think they did it with, but I think with the 404s or the, or the Stambles and Dixies, they did that. But they sold, they even sold giant beats. Oh, so, wow. Yeah, that's how far they go back. And um, cool. They could have been the ones that specified that you put a T and a B on the inside of the bell of the giant beat hi hats. So yeah. yeah, but like I said, you'll you'll see them on on Japanese eBay, um, which is which which is which is interesting. It'd be cool. It'd be cool to own one of those. Um, yeah, that'd be awesome. That seems super rare. And just again, an oddity when people see a drum brand on a symbol today or whenever you kind of it denotes a little bit of like this is a beginner symbol you'll you'll get with your set but it seems like back then there were a decent amount of fairly good symbols that would have still have that that drum logo on yeah to some degree yeah yeah so i think that kind of wraps it up with with the distributors yeah. and, and all the symbol lines um i mean i've only got really a couple couple small things left yeah, well, tell us. I mean, I think that the last thing you have on here about symbol care and uh, cleaning, you know, cleaning information does fit in with the collectible nature of things of, you know, it's like the age old thing about this would have been worth this much if you didn't clean it. Yeah. But you did clean it. So now it's worth much less. So you mean like just what's, run it <laughs> look like what's behind me? <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah. Well, run us through a little bit about what you have here, and then we'll we'll call it on call it for me. It's eleven fifteen at night, so we'll call it a night at that point. Okay. The first thing I always check is for edge damage, and to me, that's really critical because you're basically creating like a stress riser on the edge of the symbol, and to me, that's that's a crack waiting to happen. So, it's okay to buy symbol in that condition, and I actually have a couple of pictures where I either file down the flea bites, or I actually will sand them down with a cylindrical sanding disc on on my 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 battery powered drill and then I sand it by hand and I make sure that I don't create a flat spot on the symbol and I've had a couple of symbols that have some pretty serious flea bites where I had to take a decent amount of material off but we're talking like five thousandths of an inch you know yeah. so maybe ten still sounds inch. good though in, oh, well, in your opinion well there's yeah I mean you can't tell I mean it's a tiny amount no sure you sure. know but to me it's 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 peace of mind because I would be afraid of hitting the symbol in that spot, which you can't see while you're playing. But my fear is hitting it directly right on that ding on the edge of the symbol, and that's where it's going to crack. You know. Yeah. The other thing that's interesting too, and I actually dug up the pictures of both Pisces and Zildjian have in their catalogs in the past. I mean, Pisces catalog from '79 has this. It shows how to hit a symbol, and the thing that I always found very interesting is is Zildjian and Pisces show the exact same thing and zildjian calls slicing it in their in their in their catalog which i think is kind of cool you know and yeah. pisces says glancing blow and what that means is that's glancing blow sounds more of like you're going jousting or something <laughs> like that's that. right. what they mean is is when you hit a symbol you don't hit directly into the bell directly on like your tip of your stick is not pointed at the bell Right when you hit the symbol, you angle the stick uh, at an oblique angle. So when you hit it, your stick actually bounces off at an angle. It doesn't have to be a super radical angle like that, but you're not going directly in. Uh, when I found playing my symbols for years, once I saw that diagram, I would go back and forth and hit a, hit in the crack symbol directly on, and then hitting it at a glancing blow. And I'm like, you know what? The symbol sounds a little different when I do this. Yeah. I could see that. But my understanding is that alone, and the other one they say the other technique you, you could do, which is really hard to do, is actually to pull back. Is when you when you crash a symbol, don't just leave let the stick keep traveling, but actually once you make the initial impact, was you actually start to pull the stick back away from the symbol. Yeah. Those two techniques supposedly will help preserve the edge of the symbol and reduce the the chance of a cracking. Um, obviously the, the force they hit, I mean, the number one thing is obviously the thickness of the symbol, you know, I mean, when you're back to collecting classic symbols, how many paper thins are out there, you know, and, and, you know, 40, 50 year old splashes, right. 
you know, they get destroyed. They get cr- they get cracked. True. They crack because they're so small. They're so delicate. You know, I actually yep. I actually have a fortune inch paper thin that had a crack and I repaired it at a six oh two. And uh, fortunately, the crack was only the other thing too with cracks is is I treat it like cancer. The only way to fix it is cut it out. Don't drill a stop hole. The radius yeah. of the stop hole that you drill is not big enough, and you're creating a stress point. You know, you could think of it as like, you know, it, it's a kind of a, a crotch, and you've yeah. got the two sides of the alloy is flexing, and that center point right there where you've got the flexing, that's where all the stress is. You know, I even have a picture of, of somebody Just cut it. Yeah, who tried to repair a crack, and they they cut an angle too narrow, and it just cracked right at, right at the at the crotch of where that crack of the of the cutout was. Um, so yeah, it's you want to you want as as gentle radius as you could possibly cut without cutting too much material away. And sure. the only way to do that is you got to check your symbols. And as soon as you see a crack, number one, stop playing and don't even touch it until you've cut out that crack. Um, the other thing I noticed too is that, it, and this just recently dawned on me, one of the big differences between Pisces and Zildjian's, or I should say uh, Pisces and Turkish made symbols, or Zildjian and Sabians, Zildjian and Sabians, they crack along the lathing grooves and you'll get symbols that are cracked up by the bell and you'll get yeah, like a- Yeah, I've had that. Yeah. Yeah. And, I had it with a Z, a Z custom. Yeah. Huge, big crash that happened. Yeah. And and they yeah. rarely crack from the edge inward. You know, they're not perpendicular. Where with Pisces, like 99% of the time, I've only seen it on signatures where they've cracked uh, uh, with the lathing grooves. All the other Pisces I've seen, they always crack from the edge inward. Uh, yeah. Always. And that it's a good thing because when it happens, if you catch it, you know, when it's an eighth of an inch and you just grind that out, it's not going to affect the symbol like at all. You mm. won't be able to tell the difference. And you've basically, you know, it's like cutting out cancer. You've saved the symbol. You've life, saved it. You yeah. know? So, but I mean, I've seen yeah. guys, you know, oh, you know, I just keep playing it. I haven't noticed getting it bad, bigger. It's like, yeah, it'll it's, ruin your symbol. Yeah, it's, it is ruined. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's going to get bigger yeah. and bigger and bigger. Um, cleaning. So in my experience, you know, buying all these symbols, the first thing is, I guess, with cleaning is, you know, you know, kind of like Shakespeare, to clean or not to clean. That is the question, right? <laughs> yeah. So there's this romantic notion, and I, I totally get it. It really comes from old Ks, from jazz drummers playing old Ks. And the thing with old Ks is they get darker and dirtier and darker and dirtier. I mean, both physically and sound-wise with age, right? Mm-hmm. So I understand that the, the, the thinking of don't clean the symbol, you know, it's, it's aging, but, you know, coming from a completely different era and in a different background of, you know, part of it obviously is the visual aspect, as you could see, otherwise I would stick all the symbols back there and have light shining on, them, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. They're very clean. Your, your background for people listening is just an awesome <laughs> array of clean symbols. <laughs> That's yeah. about that's about a, a quarter of my collection, by the way. <laughs> um, it, it okay. So my my thinking is when Avid Silgen or Robert Peisty developed a symbol, developed a sound. He didn't go out in the backyard, bury it in the dirt for six months, and let it get all crusty and and, and oxidized. Then yeah. Dig it out of the ground and hit it and go, that's what I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah, I want that dirty sound. <laughs> well, that's a good point. You know, I mean, I know I know symbols, I know there's a period, you know, I know like like Zildjian will, will age their symbols and basically let them kind of relax for several months or a year or whatever. And I get that. I'm sure there's something to that with with kind of the, the tension, you can call it, in the alley when you first make an alley, because you're basically forging it with the hammer and rolling, you're smashing the alloy. You know, in yeah. a more compressed state. So, and over time, there's mental fatigue and wear and tear, and that goes back to like with 2002s with oh, black labels are mellower sounding than, than red labels are. Well, no, they're just they've got more miles on them. You know, they're they're basically more worn out. You know, that's probably 80, 85 percent of what you're hearing, and maybe 15 percent is a change in construction. You know. Um, so back to cleaning, my, my thinking is, especially with the 602s, is, you know, I'm kind of like on this vision quest of 
you know, I'm kind of obsessed, you know, just like your guy with Rogers, how he's really focused on, he really wanted to know all the nuts and bolts of that era of Rogers drums. You know, who who made the shells? I didn't know Keller made shells for Rogers. I always assumed Rogers made their own shells. But yeah. it's the same thing. It's like, I want to know, like with the Super Formula 602s, I want to know what, what Robert Peisty was trying to make. I want to know the sound he was looking for. So if I find a Super Formula 602 that's in pretty good shape, I'm going to clean it because that's going to make a small difference and make it sound closer to how the cymbal sounded when it was new. I want the cymbal to be as new as possible when it was brand new and you bought it in the store. That's what I'm looking for. Sure. So that's why sure. I clean my cymbals. And also, full disclosure, because they look damn good. And, and Yeah, they do look good. And that's a, pi- <laughs> that's a Peisty thing. Yes. Yes. And I, yeah. I don't know why, because you would think 602s and, and A Zildjian's would look the same because they're both B20. They don't. And even back in the 70s, it's like looking at, you know, old videos of like, film of Keith Moon playing. I can immediately tell when he's playing 602s and when he's playing A Zildjian's. You know, it, yeah. not, not only because of the shape of the bell and the curve of the bow of the symbol and also how it sounds, but the way it reflects. There's a color. Well, the way it yeah. reflects the light, you know, because sure. the lathing and hammering is totally different, you know. That John Densmore picture that I showed earlier, you could clearly see those are 602s. Those aren't Azildjans, you know? Anyways, so it, it, the other thing with Pisces, I realized because I bought a lot of the Stambul 65s, they're all B8. I cleaned them, and I've got a picture of, of one where I cleaned it, and like three hours later, it started to turn orange and brown. It oxidized like crazy. And I realized, you know, copper really likes to combine with oxygen oxygen is super reactive and and everything oxidizes all metals rust you know rusting is just oxidizing it means that that metal or alloy is combining with oxygen and creating a new new compound right so you get copper oxide or with aluminum you get aluminum oxide you know even titanium rust titanium oxide is what they use in paint pigment it's white so when you see people mm. using white oil paint that's titanium oxide Oh, wow. Anyways, um, so I realized that with B8, because there's so much copper, it's super reactive, and it oxidizes right away. And I would touch the symbol and come back two hours later, and there's these big old dark marks where I had touched it. And I had just washed my hands. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And it occurred to me, you know what? The whole thing with Pisces coating their symbols, because I'm 99% sure that they use some sort of either oil-based or water-based lacquer, and, and they always have. And I think with... When they started to produce B8 symbols in 65, Robert realized we have to coat these because by the time they get to a music store, they're just going to be like, look like crap. Yeah. They've know? been touched and d- the distributor and yeah. put in the bag. And, yeah. And, yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and with bare copper, bare B8, it's just, it oxidizes too easily. B20, you know, these 602s behind me, I'll clean them and they turn this they they get a light yellow tint after several days or a week i mean i would perform experiments where i clean a 602 and then a b8 piesty and i'd lay them on the table and i just let them sit there for like a week and i'd come in and look at them and a week later come back and i'd see how the 602 barely changed color where the b8 was like all orange you know i had like Mm. streaks on it so yeah yeah i actually developed a way to recode them using an oil-based mm. lacquer and cutting it with thinner, thin enough that I could recut the symbol. So these symbols behind me are all recoded, unless they still have the wow. clear coat, which a couple of them still did. But getting back to cleaning, um, with, with, with cleaning, not, you know, it, it, uh, there's a whole chapter on the wiki. So, so it's probably better to go through that. But with Pisces and also like modern Zildjian and Savings, they're coated as well. What you have to be careful is not use too abrasive a cleaner because you'll you'll cut through the clear coat. And once you cut through the clear coat, that's when you have problems with the symbol tarnishing much quicker. So the problem is you're creating like this catch-22 where you're trying to clean the symbol and make it look better, but your action of cleaning is actually making it tarnish quicker and look dirtier sooner. So don't be abrasive is the is the key thing. And look at the symbol wiki and which uh, all yeah. the links in the, it will be in the description for. Yeah, because you could there's there's that is a full episode on on tips and tricks of cleaning and what to do and yeah. what not to do. And there's you know, squirt catch up on it. And, and there's, <laughs> yeah, I, I tried like dozens of cleaners and coatings and all that kind of stuff. So there's a whole list of like, you know, how I rate them, you know, and I I cleaned, I would say, over the last two years. 
probably about 80 symbols. So I it was a process of, of hit, you know, of trial and error until yeah. I, I developed a te- technique that I really liked, but it's really convoluted. Um, sure. The one thing I wanted to mention is well, the first thing is, is that if the symbol is not dirty, the, fr- the number one thing is, is the sweat in your fingers is the worst thing because it's caustic and that's what will corrode a symbol. And that the salt, the sodium chloride will slowly eat through even a clear coat. And um, that's the number one thing you see that makes symbols turn green. And the oil and dirt in your fingers, that keeps the salt suspended and it stays on the symbol. So the best thing you mm-hmm. could do is wipe down your symbols with that, even Windex, you know. And it's, if, if you're a geeking drummer, it's it's hard because it's like, I'm not going to clean my symbols. Like, I'm on tour and I'm, you know, playing a show. I'm super tired. And I got to sleep in a hotel. It's like, I don't clean my symbols. But it's yeah. at some point, even if it's just, you know, Windex on a rag, just wipe down the edge. That'll make a big difference. And then at some point, soap and water. You know, if you have time, go through it. Just soap and water. And as long as you can keep that salt off the symbols, you'll keep them in that stage where you still got a full clear coat. They're still they're still protected. And you could keep them pretty much brand new. Um, wow. The other thing Just I, with a little touch-up. The other thing I try to do with, with symbol carriers, I, 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 I finally found a symbol bag, a Pisces symbol bag that has dividers, cloth dividers. So the symbols aren't rubbing against each other all the time and getting scratched. Yeah. And I have yeah, a, yeah. a lot of symbols that I bought from here, old ones like that, where they're just, the surface is just all scratched up, where they just like laid them around and, you know, it's not an abuse. It's just rubbing against other symbols. It's just a stack. Yeah. Yeah. The one thing I wanted to mention really quick about claiming, kind of to wrap it up, is I found out from, and I won't name names, but my Pisces insider. Um, <laughs> who several years ago, I think it was probably about 20 years ago, was at at Notwell. He witnessed some of the Peisty workers uh, filling the Peisty symbol cleaner bottles, the infamous orange unobtainium yes. Peisty symbol cleaner that people are yep. selling like $400 a bottle on eBay, right? Yeah. Well, Peisty doesn't make that cleaner. They never did. All they did was rebottle it from another manufacturer. And this was a common household cleaner used for cleaning stainless steel. And it was called Stahl Fix, which is German for steel fix. And it's stainless steel cleaner. And I actually have a couple pictures of the original bottle. Then they were bought out by S.E. Johnson and the name changed to Mr. Muscle. And you could still buy it today in Germany. And I actually bought several bottles I could even post a link. You have to buy a twenty-five dollar minimum. It, it's this this company. It's like a, a kind of a grocery store. They specifically sell to the U.S. for like you know German uh, expatriates when they want to buy like yeah, German yeah. German candy or cookies yeah, yeah. or crackers, and they've got household cleaners. So I wow. verified with a couple people that this is the the real thing, and it's actually Pice to use stall fix. And that is their cleaner. So you don't have to try to wow. find a bottle of Pisces cleaner. Just buy a bottle of Stall Fix and you're, you're good to go. You know, that's it. That's a good tip. Yeah. The one, Everyone has seen that bottle, that oh orange yeah. bottle. The one thing yeah. I did find out was that Pisces Pi- didn't change the formula, but the formula of their cleaner changed, I think, about 20 years ago because the smell changed slightly. And I still have a tiny bit. It's all dried up. But I have a tiny bit left of Pisces cleaner in a bottle. And... There's a gentleman I know of in Italy, and him and I were going back and forth about it when I told when I I posted it on on the the, the Pisces Facebook forum. Like, hey, this is actually the cleaner, and he's like, I'm going to buy some, and he tested it. He still had some of the of the more recent Pisces cleaner, and he's like, it's the same thing. It smells the same. It's the same consistency. That thick white milky. He's all, yeah, it, yeah. It, you're right. It is. You know, so good to know. Yeah. So cool. Well, there's an affordable uh, tip that everyone can do yeah. to start. <laughs> um, all right, Dan. Well, this is uh, this has been awesome to go through both parts. Tons of information. The amount of time and effort that you have put into this is, I hope, apparent to everyone because you have, beyond the time and energy that you've put into your outline, you've also been helping me with like put this picture here, put this picture here, which, is, which yeah. you, you've now seen the back end where like with the Neil Peart series where it's like. Yeah just the photo dropping in 
portion alone is super time consuming. So anyway, you've been a huge help to me and I appreciate you sharing uh, all your knowledge. All the links and things that we've talked about will be in the description for this. Dan's other two episodes and uh, wherever you're listening uh, or watching, if you're listening, find it on social media or send me a, a note and I, I'd love to hear what you guys think about it. But also, if you're on YouTube, write in the comments, you know, is there is there more info that you guys know? I think that everyone likes to hear, you know, if you're in Europe and you have some, you know, unique, interesting perspective on this or whatever, just more information is always great. And just let us know if you liked it. I think we would like to hear it. So um, I, I, I want to just want to throw in there again, not to sound like a like a broken record, but check out those Facebook uh, forums. Yes. I mean, it's it's, you know, the the, the the nice thing, even though Facebook is basically for old for old people now, the nice thing <laughs> about it is, is it's an old fashioned form in that all the posts are all archived and it's all chronological. So you can go back five or six years and you could spend. I mean, yeah. when I. Two years ago, I started going through these forums and I would stay up like all night, just going back yes. farther and farther down, finding these posts, like saving the pictures, you know, or yeah. I'd, I'd even copy and paste some of the, the text into a, a great resource, right? Into a document where I could save it. You know, a lot of it was, were Todd Little's posts. You know, that's basically how I met him was yeah. on, seeing all his posts on Facebook. And I'm like, hey, man, you know, you know all this stuff. So, it's great. Yep. Even if you don't even play Pisces, just to check in and say, Hey, what about this? Or what about that? Or whatever, you know, it's, it's free, you know, it's, it, it, it and it's, yeah, exactly. It, it's amazing resources. So yeah. Yeah. For sure. Said. Go to the description of this episode and part one and find those links and go join the group and uh, join the conversation. You don't have to have a single Pisces symbol. You can just get on there and start learning before you even have to buy your first Dixie symbol to get you involved yeah. or, or whatever you want. Or, Lu uh, or Ludwig Stanople. <laughs> yes, exactly. You're a first affordable and then you can get, uh, you can spend thousands and thousands of dollars later, but uh, cool. All right, Dan. Well, thank you, my friend. I appreciate it. Thank you. And thank everybody for watching. <laughs>